Okay, so we're coming up to the minute, so we'll make a beginning. Um, so again, so good afternoon to everyone that's joined. Uh, appreciate looking at the registrant list that we had people uh, who are joining from Europe and some people from the US as well. So today, what we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at dispute resolution clauses again, uh, and whilst very quickly as well, just covering off um, the current legal landscape around governing law clauses and the applicability of EU law following Brexit. We'll look quickly at what's changed, what hasn't changed and remains the same, uh, what that means for you and what you should be thinking about when it comes to drafting dispute resolution clauses in your contracts. Um, before we begin, uh, just by way of introduction, if you haven't met us before, uh, my name is Mark Davison. I'm the Head of International Arbitration here in our London office and today I'm joined by Eric France. Hi there, I'm the second part of the Double Act, uh, Eric France, uh, Commercial Disputes Partner based in our London office. Okay. Um, so very quickly before we kick off, um, there's a Q&A function as usual, so please feel free to ask questions, um, ask those whilst we're speaking or at the end. We've got about 200 people that were registered for today. Uh, and so we'll try and deal with as many questions as we can at the end. And if not, we'll try and follow up with you afterwards. Um, just before we begin, obviously, supply chains, supply chain issues are very topical at the moment. The next session in the series, we're going to focus on supply chain contracts. So I hope you're able to join us for that. Obviously, if you are experiencing an issue at the moment, then please don't feel, uh, please don't hesitate to contact Eric or me if you'd like to discuss that. Uh, and just very quickly as well, in December, we're going to run a very, uh, we're going to run a Christmas quiz uh, just recapping key contract law development. So again, I hope you're able to join us for that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Eric now, who's going to quickly discuss uh, governing law clauses. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to cover is the rules around governing law. Um, it's the governing law of the contract that sets the rules for how your, your contract should be interpreted and defines what remedies you're entitled to if the other side breaches the contract. And the good news is that Brexit hasn't had much of an impact on, on these rules. Um, it, basically, that's because the rules about governing law under, under contracts are set out in an EU treaty called Rome 1. And the member states that are remaining within the European Union will continue to be bound by Rome 1 as normal. Um, the UK is no longer bound by Rome 1 because it's left the, left the European Union, but it has incorporated the substance of th those rules into English law through, uh, through some UK legislation. So the rules in Rome 1 continue to apply both here and in the EU even after Brexit. And the Rome 1 rules deal with the situation where the parties have agreed on a choice of law, so that if the parties have agreed on uh, English law, then the courts and EU member states determining a dispute under that contract uh, are obliged to apply English law to that, that dispute, and vice versa. So English courts determining disputes under contracts that contain French governing law clauses, for example, will continue to be bound by um, and bound to apply French law. The rules in Rome 1 also deal with uh, where the contract is silent about what governing law should apply. And those rules are a bit complicated, but basically, and I'm summarizing here, there are a number of rules for different types of contracts to tell you what the governing law of that, that contract will be if there isn't a choice of law clause. And so, for example, in a contract of supply, a supply contract, the governing law is the law where the supplier is based. So if you're worried, for example, about the risk of getting into a dispute with an EU-based supplier in your supply chain, as a lot of businesses are at the moment, then you may want to check that your contract contains an English governing law clause. Because if it doesn't, and it's silent about the governing law, then it's likely that whichever court looks at a future dispute under that contract will conclude the contract's governed by the law of the EU jurisdiction where the supplier is based rather than English law. Okay, so um, secondly, we just want to have a quick look at um, the current rules about um, uh, precedents from, from EU courts and how they're applied here. Um, so separate from the governing law issue, there is now after Brexit scope for more divergence between the UK and the EU on the meaning of EU law. So, 
um, just taking a step back, English law encompasses UK legislation, case law, and EU law that's been incorporated into English law. And that last category is uh, important because the EU Withdrawal Act confirmed that to the extent possible, all existing EU law would be incorporated into the UK upon the completion of Brexit. So wherever possible, the same rules and laws that applied on the day before Brexit apply afterwards. And that's achieved a degree of certainty in the short term, but the UK Parliament is now able to amend and cancel any unwanted aspects of EU law if it chooses to. It also means that there's now more scope for the UK courts and EU courts to disagree on the meaning and application of EU law. The EU Withdrawal Act states that historic um, Court of uh, Justice of the European Union case law will have the same precedent status as decisions of the UK Supreme Court. As so, the UK courts will interpret EU-derived law by reference to the CJEU's case law as it stood at the point in time of Brexit. But going forward, the um, CJEU no longer has direct jurisdiction in the UK, and this means that we that we could well see a divergence in approach develop between the CJEU and UK courts. However, it's still likely that the UK courts will still have regard to decisions of the CJEU when applying EU law principles. So contract parties will, will therefore need to consider what impact EU law um, as interpreted by the UK courts has on their, have on their contracts, particularly those drafted um, in order to rely upon um, certain EU laws. So what, one example of that is where, one example where EU law will still be relevant will be the area of commercial agency agreements. So in that, that field, EU sourced rules provide for certain protections uh, for commercial agents in certain circumstances, certain rules about when you can terminate a commercial agency, et cetera. And there is now increased scope for divergence as to how the, the UK and the EU courts will interpret those rules. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly focus now on dispute resolution clauses. Um, what I mean by dispute resolution clauses is principally around what jurisdiction or court will hear your case. Um, so what I mean by enforcing any judgment uh, you get, um, especially when you're dealing with the EU counterparties, when I'm talking about jurisdiction, what I mean is what court or country are you entitled to bring your contract claim and will hear your case? And then by enforcement, what I mean is uh, in what country will you be able to enforce a judgment? Just as a quick refresher, and hopefully um, we all know what this was, but the old regime was that the UK was part of something, something called the Brussels recast regime. And that regime continued to apply for any cases filed in the UK courts before the 31st of December 2020. Put simply, what the Brussels recast regime meant was that the EU and the UK courts would stay any proceedings which had been brought in the wrong court um, contrary to what was specified in a dispute resolution clause. And it would also allow for the reciprocal enforcement of each other's judgments. But where are we now and what happens in respect of any new claims that need to be filed? So I think, as we, again, as we all know, the UK's preferred approach was to try and join something called the Lugano Convention. Lugano is a convention which governs jurisdiction and the enforcement of judgments between the EU and what are known as FDEB states, so European Free Trade Association states. So that's Switzerland, Iceland and Norway. And it operates very similarly to the way that the old Brussels regime worked before that was recast in 2012. Whilst it'd be ideal if we could, if the UK could join that, whilst um, UK counterparties are dealing with EU counterparties, that's it's not going to happen. Um, the UK it's submitted its application to join Lugano back in April last year. The EFTA states agreed, and the EU to date has not. And the European Commission earlier this year stated that it would not recommend accepting the UK's application, and that's unlikely to change. I mean, just in respect of why the EU is seeking to block the UK's accession to Lugano, it's interesting to look at some recent comments from the chair of the European Parliament's Committee on Legal Affairs, 
and what he had to say about this. So the way that he put it was that effectively being part of the Lugano Convention requires as a matter of principle to have that close link to the single market, respecting EU regulation and accepting the European Courts of Justice hierarchy. And so he went on to continue and said that, well, as we know, a key element of the Brexit deal is that the UK is no longer part of the single market, precisely due to the fact that the British refuse to apply European law in their territory. And so he said that even though the matter is still under discussion, he says that effectively for a third country, which the UK would be, uh, as unattached to the single market as the UK is, his view was that matters of civil judicial cooperation should be regulated by the Hague Convention. So where we are now is that we're going to have to rely on the Hague Convention if we're looking for a convention which provides an easy mechanism for a relatively straightforward in, in enforcing judgments from the UK against EU counterparties based in the EU. So just really quickly, in terms of what the Hague Convention is, it, it is what it says on the tin. It's a, a convention dealing with the choice of court, agree, court agreements between commercial parties. It's currently been ratified by the EU. Uh, Denmark ratified it later on, but Denmark is also in there. And also Mexico, Montenegro and Singapore. But it's not been ratified by any other Lugano states. So Switzerland, Iceland and Norway are out. Um, the UK joined in its own right as of the 1st of January 2021, and the EU didn't have a right to block that. Uh, I'll come back on to why that's relevant later. Um, just of interest as well, uh, the US, China and Ukraine have signed the convention but haven't ratified it yet, so it's not in force in those jurisdictions. The US doesn't appear to be taking any steps to ratify the convention, and interestingly, in respect of China, it's slightly different because the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs has indicated um, recently a wish for the Hague Convention to become effective in China as soon as possible. So that could actually provide um, something of interest if you're dealing regularly with Chinese counterparties. Just standing back, it's actually it's interesting just to look briefly at the history of the Hague Convention and how it developed. So the idea behind the convention originated in the 1990s as a project to effectively try and create a worldwide model to reflect what was in place under the Brussels and the Lugano regimes at the time. And it was hoped that it would effectively become the court equivalent of the New York Convention 1958. And that's the convention which deals with the reciprocal enforcement of arbitration awards around the world, which now has over 160 signatory states to it. I think whilst the ambition of the Hague Convention was to create something on a worldwide scale that was akin to Brussels, I think it fairly became apparent that it was a bit too difficult to try and get states to sign up to something of that magnitude. And so they quickly scaled that down to what we effectively now see in the 2005 convention, namely to that on the choice of course agreements in commercial cases and the enforcement of judgments of the courts designated by such agreements. And effectively, the object of the Hague Convention is to try and promote international trade and investment through enhanced judicial cooperation. To date, there has really been little attention as to um, how the Hague Convention works, and that's certainly so before the end of last year. And the reason for that was that effectively it had limited applicability, given that we had the Brussels recast and Lugano regimes here in the UK and in the EU. Um, so, for example, the, the Brussels recast regime took precedent over the Hague Convention regime when both were in play. So just quickly turning to what the Hague Convention does. So in short, it just provides a mechanism that gives effect to exclusive choice of court agreements in a contracting state. <clears throat> so effectively, what it requires is that the chosen court specified in an exclusive jurisdiction clause has to hear the case. Any other court where a case is incorrectly brought um, must refuse to hear it. And that the judgment of the chosen court will be recognised and enforced in other Hague Convention cases. So, for example, in Mexico, Singapore or in the EU, etc. 
So just in respect of the requirements of the Hague Convention, so first, the Hague Convention, it only applies to international agreements. What I mean by that is an agreement will be international unless parties are from the same state and all the other elements relevant to the dispute, uh, regardless of the location of the chosen court, are um, connected only with that state where the parties are from. So if you take an example of, say, you've got two English parties that enter into a contract to be performed in England, there's no other foreign element to the dispute apart from the fact that they've chosen the Singapore or French courts to determine the dispute. Um, any judgment in that case would not be covered by the Hague Convention. Um, you should also note as well that it equally applies within the UK as well. So if you have an English party entering into a contract with a Scottish party for, say, services performed in Wales and they choose Northern Ireland as the exclusive jurisdiction, um, again, that would not be international for the purposes of the Hague Convention. Um, the most important aspect of the Hague Convention, however, is the fact that the um, it only applies where there is an exclusive jurisdiction agreement between the parties. What I mean by that is that you have to say that the, you know, the English, the French, the German courts have exclusive jurisdiction to hear a dispute. So if you just look at the three examples there on the screen, the first two would be covered under the Hague Convention. And even though the second doesn't state exclusive, um, the, some of the explanatory notes to the convention say that that isn't sufficient to be covered. Obviously, the third clause there would not be sufficient to be covered by the Hague Convention because it says, as it says on the tin, uh, it's non-exclusive to the English courts. Um, there's an interesting debate about asymmetric clauses. And so, in, in short, effect, the, the convention doesn't seem to apply to asymmetric clauses. What I mean by asymmetric clauses is that effectively, if you've got a dispute resolution clause which allows one party to bring proceedings in any court it sees fit, but the other is bound to stay in one court, um, they're popular in banking agreements um, because usually the bank wants to be able to litigate wherever it sees fit. It's been debated whether they're covered by the Hague Convention in um, in three recent commercial court cases here in the UK, uh, one of which went to the Court of Appeal, um, all unfortunately on OBITA basis. Um, so the High Court's view in two of the three cases was that asymmetric clauses do fall within the Convention, but the Court of Appeal has, um, they're not particularly convinced by that, and they said that it seems that the, the objective meaning of the convention is that asymmetric clauses would not be covered by the convention, but there is a debate as to whether the, that intention is achieved by the drafting of the convention. But I think given the Court of Appeals commentary here, although it was on an obiter basis, I think we can be safe to assume that, um, that asymmetric clauses won't be covered by the Hague Convention as a matter of the, the UK courts are concerned. Obviously, what the UK courts have said is not binding on EU courts. Um, and so it, it might be that that gets clarified at some point in, uh, later. Just quickly, just on non-exclusive um, jurisdiction clauses, I should just say that there is, in theory, a mechanism under the Convention which states can extend that to apply to judgments which flow from a non-exclusive jurisdiction clause. But as, as yet, no state has exercised that option, so um, that's not currently in play. Um, just quickly as well, um, the Hague Convention, it does not cover interim measures of, measures of protection. So any interim orders, such as interim freezing injunctions, will not be enforceable under the Hague Convention. Um, it's also important to know as well that Hague Convention um, re reflects how Brussels worked in terms of it doesn't apply to consumer or employment disputes. So you can't have terms and conditions stating that any dispute uh, has to be referred to the exclusive jurisdiction of the English courts and then try and enforce against the French consumer through the Hague Convention when they don't pay for your goods. Um, and that equally applies to uh, employment issues as well, just in that odd scenario, if you've got any uh, employees who are domiciled in an EU jurisdiction. Just lastly as well, um, 
I've, I've touched on when the UK joined. Um, there is a debate as to as to effectively when the Hague Convention um, applies in respect of agreements entered into with UK counterparties. So the UK's position is that it applies to any exclusive jurisdiction agreement entered into after the 1st of October 2015. And that has been enshrined on the statute book under the legislation which brought the Hague Convention into force here in the UK. The EU's position, however, is that it only applies to exclusive jurisdiction agreements entered into after the 1st of January 2021, because that was the date when the UK joined in its own right. So the UK's position is, well, we've been a member of the Hague Convention since the 1st of October 2015, when we joined uh, by nature of being part of the EU. That's the date when the EU joined the Hague Convention. And the EU's position is, no, 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 you joined on the 1st of January 2021, so that's when it applies from. So in respect, if you're trying to enforce in the EU in respect of any agreement entered into before the 1st of January 2021 that had an exclusive jurisdiction clause, then um, there is going to be a debate there in the EU as to whether or not the Hague Convention applies. And it's likely that that issue is going to have to be resolved at some point by the Courts of Justice of the European Union. So um, all well and said and good for Brexit, that we won't be impacted by the Court of Justice of the European Union decisions anymore, because obviously this is a key one where we're dealing with uh, EU counterparties. Um, if the Hague Convention doesn't apply to your agreement, then a new, um, sorry, if it doesn't apply to an agreement that you have with an EU counterparty and you need to go and enforce in the EU, then effectively what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to look at local laws of the state where you're trying to enforce to see how you'll be able to enforce. That should be possible, um, but it's just going to add that extra layer of cost and time to effectively get to your money judgment. Um, the good news is for those of you that use arbitration is that Brexit and all this um, who are around the Hague Convention doesn't affect arbitration clauses or how you go about enforcing arbitration awards, both in the UK and the EU. Uh, and that's because both the UK and the EU are parties to something called the New York Convention 1958, which I touched on earlier. So um, we'll deal with uh, any questions. So the first one is about uh, international contracts and can the jurisdiction governing law clause be the same country when neither party of the contract is based? So if, for example, the supplier does not agree with the governing law of England and Wales. So, yeah, so take an example. Um, you're an English counterparty, you're dealing with a US counterparty and they don't want to have a um, English law governing law clause or an English law um, jurisdiction clause. The, the parties are free to, to, to agree whatever it is that they want to agree. Um, so um, um, you, you can choose any, the law of any jurisdiction that you want, uh, plus the, um, the, the, sorry, the governing law um, of any jurisdiction you want, and equally any courts that you want to refer your dispute to. Uh, that's part of party party autonomy. Um, so for example, I, I spent, um, about two and a half years working in the Middle East in Dubai and so it's regularly for me to see um, contracts between Middle East parties so you know one based in the UAE one based in Saudi who would refer their agreements to English law English court litigation. Um, I think there's just a question of here just how do you find out whether a law is retained EU law or not? Um, it's a good question. It's um, and we, again, we could spend hours on this. Um, there isn't a specific list of retained EU law for lawyers to refer to. It's a matter of statutory interpretation. So basically, retained EU law is supposed. I think, as Eric said, it's supposed to act like a snapshot as of the thirty first of December, twenty twenty. And then, in order to work it out, uh, you need to look at things such as whether. The EU law had direct or indirect effect at the time, and then how it's been dealt with within the Brexit statutory instruments. 
and sort of again whether any judgments have been on the topic uh, a bit sorry any judgments have been made on the particular law or eu law provision that you're you're looking at um i think what's probably going to be helpful is just to keep an eye on court cases going forward that have to determine any issues around this e it retained eu law issue as hopefully that might provide some guidance on that issue okay uh there's just another one here about does the European Convention of Human Rights still apply? Um, but in short, yes, I hope it does anyway. Uh, we've still got <clears throat> the Human Rights Act 1998 here in the UK, uh, which effectively provides a statutory basis for the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, what is the position with recognition of proceedings vis-a-vis -vis insolvency post-Brexit? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I might try and pick up with that, uh, the person that's asked that question after this, as it's not something which I uh, regularly come across um, in respect of insolvency. Um, certainly the position before was we had the cross-border insolvency regulations. Okay, and I think just given the time as well, we've just got one here about, is there, is there any explanatory report Report similar to the Gerard report. Uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so the Gerard the Gerard report that the Gerard report was effectively it was the explanatory notes behind the Brussels regime, uh, not the Brussels recast regime, the Brussels regime when it originally came into force, and effectively that tried to provide guidance around the certain provisions of the. Uh, the Brussels regime and how it was supposed to work. Um, it was used a lot in court cases to try and sort of interpret the, the way that um, that specific provisions in the um, um, specific provisions in uh, the, 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 the Brussels recast regime was supposed to work. That there is something for the Hague Convention. It's called the Hartley Report. Uh, it was drafted with um, a, a Japanese professor, a Japanese law professor. Who, forgive me, I've forgotten the name of uh, now, but that, sim that operates similar to the way that the Gennard Report worked. So again, if you're looking as to how the Hague Convention worked in practice, that's well worth taking a look at. It's just then, one, one last one here. Um, somebody's asked, in your opinion, which jurisdiction governing law is the most favourable to, to the UK should the counterparty refuse to agree to England and Wales governing law or jurisdiction? Um, well, I think that when it comes to governing law, it's, it's not possible to generalise because it depends really on what, what the dispute's about, what part of, what part of the law um, relates to the dispute. And what kind of party you are. So for example, if you are a consumer, you know, uh, the laws in the Europe in different EU jurisdictions might be might be helpful to you. If you're uh, if you are an, an insurer, then then English law is famously very friendly to to insurers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It really depends what kind of um, what kind of dispute we're dealing with. So you can't really generalize when it comes to the governing governing law. When it comes to jurisdiction, um, then you know. I think that if, if you if you wanted an English jurisdiction clause, but you can't have one, I think what most people would do in that situation is agree to um, uh, some some form of arbitration rules um, as an as a as a as an alternative to to the English courts. I don't know if you've got anything you want to say about that, Mark. What do you yeah, it's just to say as well that if if say say for the sake of argument, your counterparty agreed English court, but they wanted French law or Russian law or US law to actually be the governing law of the contract. Actually, um, the UK courts are very well versed at dealing with foreign law issues. Uh, effectively, what happens is you get um, experts from that foreign law jurisdiction to tell the judge how it works, and so the UK courts are well versed with that. Um, I suspect it's probably the same in, you know, in other established jurisdictions like New York or Singapore, for example. Um, I haven't sort of come across the issue yet within um, an EU court in terms of because um, they they principally deal with civil law issues anyway. So I've not seen them trying to grapple with English common law. Um, but yeah, I think that's just something as well to, to note as well.
Okay, we like to be prompt on contract conversations, and we're we're we've hit the half hour mark, so we will um, we'll finish up there. Um, we'll follow up separately with those of you that have asked questions that we haven't had time to get to now. Um, please do complete the um, the feedback poll. We we like um, to get your feedback. Uh, next time we're going to look at uh, supply contract disputes, as Mark mentioned before. In December, we're going to have a fun uh, Christmas uh, quiz. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, if you do have any further questions, that, that you, then please do get in touch with us by LinkedIn or, or email. Uh, and um, that's, all, that's all for today. Great. Thanks a lot, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Take care.